the maids of water feet. They all arrived for a pleasure visit. Pleasure visit to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do a roll call, please. Alderman Wilson? Here. Alderman Lewis? Here. Alderman Bradford? Here. Alderman Old? Here. Alderman Bell? Here. And Alderman Bocart? Here. Approval for August 2nd, 2022 me meeting minutes. I'll make that motion. Can I get a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Adjustment and or approval for the agenda? I'll make that motion. Can I get a second, please? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Special items, uh, Jeff Chitwood slash audit report. Staff report, please. Jeff Chetwood is here from Gurney Courting and Chetwood to give you an overview of the audit that you received in your packet as well as the book that you provided. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Shelley. Um, as, as Shelley mentioned, my name is Jeff Chetwood. I'm with Gurney Courting and Chetwood in Boonville. Uh, we performed the audit this year of the city, uh, and I'm going to go over kind of a brief overview of that audit report for you. If you have any questions, please feel free to let me know, and I can uh, answer those. If I don't know the answer, I can look them up when I get back to the office to let you know. So, um, first, wanted to thank the city, uh, especially the city, city staff, for helping us with the audits. Um, going through an audit uh, can can be very time-consuming, uh, getting everything ready for us. Um, the city this year was able to provide information to us in a timely manner. Um, obviously, the, the end of the year for you guys is, is April 30th, and we're here in August and presenting an audit report, was, which is a pretty quick turnaround, which is a testament to the staff of getting information to us. So uh, I did want to thank Kyle, Darla, and Shelly, uh, as well as the other staff members who helped us during the audit, but um, it went really smoothly, smoothly this year, and we appreciate that. Uh, as far as the audit report goes, I know you have that in front of you. Um, I'm just going to go over some parts of that just to give you kind of a general idea of how that's put together. Uh, the opinion we issued was an unmodified opinion. Unmodified opinion is the best opinion that we can give. Uh, basically says that we feel that your financial statements are materially correct. Uh, that is our opinion on those and we can modify the report to say otherwise. So unmodified is the best opinion you can get and that's the opinion that the city received this year from us. Uh, the financial statements for the city are prepared, prepared on the modified cash basis, which means there are some uh, accrual matters such as fixed assets and debt and things like that that are shown. Um, and there are some things that are not shown on the financial statements, accounts payable, accounts receivable, inventories, things like that. So the financial statements are prepared on the modified cash basis, uh, and that's what is stated in the opinion as well. So pages 4 through 12 of the audit report uh, are the financial statements, the main basic financial statements of the city. Uh, page 4 starts with the uh, government-wide statements and basically how a, a governmental entity's financial statements are put together. The beginning part are kind of an overall overview of the city. Uh, we have governmental activities which include your general fund, street fund, capital projects fund, things like that. We have business type activities which include your water, sewer, sanitation funds. So those are all kind of broken out into those two categories lumped together onto one statement. So on page four is the statement of net position, which is basically the balance sheet of the city. So you can see as of April 30th, uh, net position of the governmental activities was $6.9 million, net position of the business type 12.3 which is basically your fund balances or um, overall net income since the city was started, uh, your balances in there. So the differences between your assets that are shown and the liabilities that are shown is your net position, um, taking into account changes um, over the year income statement wise as well. So page five is the uh, statement of activities of the city, which is basically the income statement of the government wide uh, entity. So it is also broken out um, by, by governmental activities as well as business type activities. So you can see kind of the revenues, the expenses that have come in in a very general sense um, that are put together on that particular statement for you. 
going back uh, to page six, we get into a little bit more detail. This is kind of the, the older version of the financial statements for governmental entities. This to me is, is better to read and more meaningful to most governments than the previous statements I just talked about. So these talk about the governmental funds of the, of the city. So these are the general fund, street fund, uh, are the major funds of the city. And the other governmental funds, which I'll talk about in just a second, are, um, are rolled up into one column uh, for you to look at. So page six is the balance sheet of the governmental funds themselves. Uh, and page seven is the income statement. So it's in a little more detail. Um, it's still, we group a lot of accounts together to, to put together into what your revenues and expenditures are. But you're able to see in a little more detail what some of those revenue, some of those expenditures, what they are, where they came from. So those are the governmental funds, uh, pages six and seven of the city. Um, I will say that the general fund balance, if you look at that on page, page seven, um, was uh, $1.7 million at the end of the year. One of the things uh, we kind of look at sometimes just to kind of see how healthy a city is uh, governmental wise is to look at that ending fund balance as a, as a percentage of the total expenditures for the year. So we like to see at least 25% um, as a ratio there. The city's ratio is 72%, which basically means um, they had a, a nine month operating fund balance existing at the end of the year to cover the city's expenditures for that particular, particular year. So general fund, it was around 72%. Overall, the governmental funds were around 80%, which is, is very, very high. So that's that's a good thing for the city. I did want to kind of point that out. And that's this is something we kind of look at. Um, we can kind of give some guidance if, if that is looking good, looking bad. Um, but for the city, it's, it's a fairly high percentage as of April 30th of 2022. Uh, page 10 starts your, your business type or your enterprise fund uh, balance sheet. So that will break out the water, sewer, and sanitation in different columns to let you see each of those individual funds balances as of April 30th. And then page 11 is the income statement for those particular funds. Uh, page 10 and 11 are uh, the enterprise funds are presented on a little bit more of a closer to an accrual basis uh, statement. Uh, the, the governmental funds in accordance with governmental standards are presented on an economic resources. So it's really the next few months activities are what is expected to be collected or things like that is shown in, in, in on those particular statements. So if you're, you're tying from the enterprise funds to the governmental funds that are put together a little bit differently, governmental accounting standards require that. Enterprise funds are usually more, run more like a business um, is why that is done. Governmental funds have your taxes and things like that are, that are more run more like a government uh, you, you generally think about. So there is a little bit of difference between the two types of, of statements themselves, um, and that, that's the reason for that. So page 13 starts the footnotes, and the footnotes give a little bit more detail of some different accounts that are in the financial statements themselves. So there'll be some cash disclosures, capital asset disclosures, debt disclosures, things of that nature that will explain exactly kind of what those balances are on the financial statements and give you a little more information uh, what those balances were at the beginning of the year, the end of the year, the activity throughout the year, and things like that. So those go all the way to page 33. And starting on page 34, I mentioned earlier there's some governmental funds lumped together on our governmental statement. And on 34, it lists out those governmental funds, the court fund, park storm water, water tax fund, debt service fund, and capital projects fund. So these statements are those individual funds themselves. They're more towards the end of the report. Um, they're usually not as large. There are calculations done to determine if they're major or not. These are not major funds of the city. So they're listed out back behind with both the balance sheet income statement and then budgetary schedules for those particular statements as well. Page uh, 40 is the internal control report. And this is where, um, when we do a financial audit, we're not coming in and looking at every single transaction. We're not coming in and looking at every single compliance issue. We're doing a financial audit. Uh, but if there are things that we want to point out to management of the city, we would put that here in this report. So there's levels of, of weaknesses that we would put in here. Material weaknesses are the most serious. Uh, significant
significant deficiencies are below that. Um, and then there's compliance issues that are not really related to the other two, but if there's something we see um, that we want to suggest to the city and point out about compliance, we would put that here. We did not have any material weaknesses, did not have any significant deficiencies, which is, is good. Uh, we had one compliance issue relating to the budget, which is listed on page 42. Uh, Shelly, Kyle, and I have spoken with that, emailed back and forth about that. You can see the response there at the bottom, which is sounds like that um, issue will be taken care of going forward. I have full confidence that it will be. Um, so that's not an unusual comment that we have in city audits. Um, we have it quite a bit, actually. Um, and I think if you read there the, the views of the responsible officials and plain corrective action, you can see how that's going to be remedied going forward. So I, I have no doubt in my mind that that will be. Um, so that's kind of the audit itself, the audit report itself. You also probably have an audit communication letter, which is a separate packet, just a few pages, where if there were any suggestions we wanted to give to you below a significant deficiency level, we would put those there, um, called control deficiencies, and we didn't have anything additional to suggest to put in that audit communication letter. So um, that's kind of the audit report itself. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that I mentioned um, about the auditing process or your financial statements in particular. Can we get a motion for special items? Uh, you don't necessarily, there's no action to take on. Okay. This one. Any questions from the staff? Thank you, sir. Take Thank you. Make a detailed analysis. Yeah, you're welcome. And, and if you have questions, um, you can take a look at it in more detail. Feel free to give us a call at the office. We have an answer. So. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Section three appointments to the board and commissions. We have none. Uh, section four schedule public meetings. Uh, none. Just a reminder if there is public comments or questions, uh, we need to have those into the city clerk by Wednesday of the meeting date. Section five. Uh, public hearing. Public hearing property tax rate for 2022. I guess staff report, please. Yes. Uh, as included in your packet, the city has received our property tax calculations from the state auditor's office. The city is required to hold a public hearing and set this tax rate prior to September 1st. Uh, there's no change to this tax rate from prior year. Uh, this is more or less just a, a matter of business that needs to be done on an annual basis. Financial impact appears to be about $200,000 and anticipated revenue off of that, uh, that tax rate of 0.2404 cents. Any questions for extent? Right. Introductions to first reading. Council bill number... Uh, oh, sorry. Public hearing. Oh, public hearing. Sorry. <laughs> Open to public comment. Open to public comment, please. Sounds like no new taxes, so yeah. everyone's excited. Yeah. <laughs> I should tell you that all my, a lot of our other towns have tiny little increases. You were my first with none. <laughs> so it's like a thousandth of a cent increase for most of the places. But it's going up. Mm. No public comments. Moving on to first reading. Council Bill number 2022-022, an ordinance extending the corporate limits of City of Ashland, Ashland, City of Ashland, Missouri, by annexing unincorporated area, directing the city clerk to give a notice of annexation of lost property. I guess staff report, please. Uh, we'd like to table it at this time. Included in your packet, uh, we'll get to you, Brian. Okay. Included in your packet is staff report for this annexation. As indicated, we are past the protest period. Should the board desire to take action on this, you are now entitled to for the statutory requirements. Mr. Welch did reach out at the end of last week requesting that they table this for one more meeting uh, to allow for further action to occur between the Smar and Welch families. Um, Again, it's kind of up to the board. If you want to table it for a meeting, you're more than welcome to. You're also welcome to take an action against it or however you see fit. Uh, you can certainly approve the first reading this evening. That still gives at least one more meeting to resolve uh, issues with the, the section of property that was carved out of this annexation. And I would just simply highlight, as a matter of law, uh, that's 
my legal opinion as well. It is right to move today if you want. You're certainly not required to. It's, it's your discretion. Dealer's choice. Do we get a motion for a table or discussion? Or I move that we table it. Can I get a second? I'll second. Sure. All right, we'll council bill. I'm sorry. Who seconded it? Uh, right. Sorry. You need to open it for discussion if you want or All call right. for the vote. Um, follow up for discussion. Any discussion, question, comments? All right, so council bill number 2022-02, an ordinance to extend the corporate limits of the city of Ashland, Missouri, by annexing an unincorporated area, directing the city clerk to give notice of annexation of the lost property. Can I get a motion to table it? No, there was a motion. Motion to table, table it. On. Can I get a roll call vote? Alderman Bocart? No. Alderman Bell? Aye. Alderman Old? Aye. Alderman Bradford? Aye. Alderman Lewis? Aye. And Alderman Wilson? Aye. Motion carries. We will table this one. Council Bill number 202-23, an ordinance revising and amending the city ordinance regarding home occupation. Can I get a staff report, please? Yes, sir. Sure. Um, so we had, Labor Law, that is our law firm, had prepared a model ordinance in an effort to comply with the newly enacted law. Um, it's House Bill 1662. I've given the uh, Port of Alderman prior comments about this. It changes the definition of in-home businesses. Um, I, our firm prepared a model ordinance that, you know, we were concerned about um, a number of things. Uh, the bill specifically says cities cannot take steps to regulate various things. In our estimation, it largely uh, got kind of guts commercial zoning. Prepared a statute in an effort to kind of salvage some things, presented that to the Board of uh, Funding and Zoning. Um, your Representative Walsh and a representative who was involved in the drafting process gave very thoughtful testimony. They pointed out that some of the things that we had suggested, again, as a firm, were contrary to some of the directives. As an example, it says in the statute you cannot require a business permit. We see our model ordinance said you need to get an affidavit. After a pretty good discussion about this, it was very civil, very informative, but vigorous. Um, planning and zoning was uh, unhappy with that uh, statute, so or rather ordinance. So what we've done is drafted a, a second ordinance, the one that's in your packet, um, that I think fairly is more faithful to the statute. We removed um, significantly four things. Uh, our model ordinance made an effort to limit the number of folks in the house kind of an occupancy limit based on floor space. That has been deleted in the new revised version. We had a sign limitation. Um, we were just concerned about that. There's nothing about signs in the statute, but went ahead and removed that as well. Um, we removed our affidavit requirement. Um, and our, again, our, our thought process was to try to have some notion of who is having an in-home business and who is not. Um, but the statute does say no prior approval required. And it's not unreasonable to say that. And then finally, um, we took the position, the statute, as signed by the governor, says you cannot require an in-home business license. That's the exact verbiage. We said, well, fine, you can require a regular old business license. But again, the statute does have verbiage saying no prior approval required. So the, the revised version takes that out. Um, I, I'm here to explain those changes. We've got the, the same elected officials here tonight. Um, I don't know what this board... I'm happy to answer, I mean, I, I'm, I give you a legal opinion. You now have two kind of options in front of you, I suppose. Uh, the model one, um, the one that's more faithful to the statute, you all can pass one or the other or not any of them or give me marching orders, Todd, we'd like to do this. Todd, we don't want to be first. Um, I, I don't want to belabor this point because you've heard me uh, previously discuss some of our concerns. We believe there's a great opportunity for what I would describe as maybe well-meaning abuse, late-night businesses that you might not want next to you. But, um, again, I don't want to belabor the points. P&G gave us a lot of attention. I'm certainly grateful for their insight and their contributions. Um, I don't know if you all had any specific questions for me. Uh, Nathan and I spent a great deal of time working on this and happy to address any questions or concerns you may have. I do have a question or concern. Please. Um, it states in here that it was submitted to 
planning and zoning after conducting a public hearing, they recommended the Board of Aldermen amend the zoning, but they in fact tabled it, so they have not recommended it. So, so we right. that. It, it, it's, I mean, I, I, I didn't take a vote, I asked for a poll. One of the, all, one of the members of that board felt it was good as written, so it was clearly not, they were not happy with it. Uh, it was formally tabled um, in order to give this board sort of the option. Um, I, I have no personal stake in it, um, but it was sort of an odd procedure, um, and, I, and I will concede for all of you, every town that we represent is having similar struggles. Um, uh, every city in the state is almost certainly going to have ordinances and zoning regulations that will be in conflict with this statute. Uh, it is it's a sweeping change, to be sure. Um, and so, um, I, I don't give this as an excuse, but I think that part of the the unusual process is, is a function of the drastic shift that's there. Uh, whether that's a good idea or a bad idea is for your judgment. That's what you're here, all here for. Um, I, uh, again, I, I don't know if how you might want to handle this, Mr. Mayor. Um, if if the, the members of the board have, have reviewed the proposed things, it might be efficient to just you know, gauge interest if somebody has some burning concerns. If, I know Mr. Volkart asked me, I don't know if I satisfied your, your question before we started, um, but um, I don't feel like we need to repeat necessarily what happened in PNZ if you all don't want it. But if you would like the full rundown on every little thing, we certainly can. Next question. Well, I still don't see how we can say in this ordinance that they recommended that we pass it when they, in fact, did not. I mean, they didn't recommend that we not pass it, they it tabled was, it. So, and that is um, correct. But, yeah, I'm interested in what happened at PNC. So, uh, uh, and again, I'll try to make it efficient. Um, I showed up, <coughs> I reiterated, because I'd never appeared before the board, I reiterated some of the concerns that I've given this board. For example, um, you could have a business, uh, the one I typically use is, you could have a pool hall in your house. And you could do that at 3 in the morning, and that's okay. You don't need a business license, it's fine. Um, my parade of horribles, I, I don't think heavily regulated industries would work. You're probably not going to be able to have a bar because of liquor licenses. Adult businesses are heavily regulated. But um, you could have a bakery, for example. And the statute says you cannot bar any particular industry. So you couldn't have something that says you may not have, uh, oh, I don't know, a pet store in your house. Cannot ban business hours. If I want to operate my pool hall at 3 a.m., I can't. You cannot have a license of any sort, any prior approval. Um, and we got concerned about the potential for folks to, uh, you know, if, some, if somebody has a lemonade stand, that's not much of a problem. But if you wanted to have a restaurant, uh, I thought about a coffee shop. What if I undercut Starbucks by 50% and had that in my house? I could do that with this statute. Um, and you have, it's an entitlement. You're allowed to do it without anything and any zoning regulation to the contrary. That was sort of the, the crux. Um, and I told the board, or rather the commission, I said, look, we have these concerns. We've taken some steps. There are some things that are plainly not negotiable. You cannot limit the time of business, the end. So we made no effort for that. Um, at the risk of being, I, I'm not trying to cue here, it says you cannot require an in-home business license. We took the position okay, maybe we should require a regular old everyday business license. This would help with tax collection. We would know where businesses are. Um, but as I said, a, not the bill sponsor officially, but a, a Mr. Representative Rosco gave, uh, he said, look, there's three provisions in here that try to make it plain. We did not intend for you to have to get any sort of business license. It, and again, I think a reasonable bill is a three. We felt it would be good to have something. So the board of PNZ was unhappy with that provision, so we took it out in our revision. The affidavit was, you know, sort of a, a simple way. So, for example, there's a noise complaint, and the police show up at the door at three in the morning. Um, if you knew already that they had a business license, that might impact the police officer's decision. So, uh, the other, uh, the one thing that was in the model that's not in the statute that we kept, the actual statute does have a single provision pertaining to traffic. And I would submit to you the first complaint that would happen in any city where somebody takes this statute and kind of runs with it is a very popular business. Somebody puts Starbucks in a residential neighborhood, right? So the, an in-home business, quote, 
cannot cause a substantial increase in traffic to the residential area. That's a, a, a perfectly reasonable thing to say. Our concern was it doesn't define a substantial increase. Is two cars is substantial? Is it 200? There's no mechanisms for a volume study, this sort of thing. So we wrote into our statute um, things that I think are commonsensical. You can park on the property that abuts the business to try and limit this, to enforce this provision. There is also something, it's the only loophole, if you will. A political subdivision may establish reasonable regulations in a home-based business if they are narrowly tailored for the purpose of, and among other things, is traffic control. So the statute itself does not provide model traffic ordinances, but ours does. Um, the uh, the uh, gentleman who was involved with the drafting of the bill had some other changes. He had some thoughtful recommendations. Um, in fairness to the gentleman, I mean, I, I don't. I mean, he, he's an elected official from O'Fallon. I'm sure he, he means well. I, I don't think and his intention was to help small businesses and homes. Uh, I agree with that. This will make it easier to have an in-home business without question. And I think mom and pops that are, are thoughtful and courteous neighbors, I don't imagine it will cause you a problem. But if somebody does something less um, appealing, they are in a very difficult time limiting it. Again, I think it's not unreasonable to say, and this is not my opinion, it's the opinion of 10 lawyers who've looked at this in our firm, kind of guts commercial zoning. There's no need to build a lot of businesses in a commercial zone. You can do it in your house now. Um, whether or not Ashland will it'll be a problem here or not, I don't know. But that was the substance of the discussion. A lot of the members had insights. Some of them were happy, some of them were not. A lot of good questions were posed. Um, Representative Walsh gave a, a very short, but I think very compelling position about the, the attitude of Ashland as a community for business, which I think was a valuable insight. So um, I candidly concede to you all, this is not an easy situation. Um, and it does involve judgment on many fronts, political, economic, the character of your residential neighborhoods is, will be affected by this conceivably. Um, and so while I have strong opinions about this and so does my firm, my goal here tonight was to try and be fair and reasonable and give a fair recitation of what happened. I, I, I think I'm try, trying to be as fair as possible, but for the sake of moving forward, it would strike me that one of, I could say, one of three things should probably happen. We, you all could say, Todd, we're worried about the things you're saying. We like your model ordinance. Todd, uh, thank you for the uh, paranoia, <laughs> uh, abundance of caution, but we just as soon have a statute that, or rather an ordinance that more faithfully follows the statute. A perfectly reasonable position to take, and you could do that. Or third, you could say, Todd, look, thank you for the sort of and I think they're either end of the spectrum, I think, fairly. We would like this fiddled with. We would like that changed. Um, the law does become effective on August 28th. Um, it's, so conceivably, it, it really depends upon what problem arises. Um, you know, we have lots of ordinances that would be in violation of the statute. We have zoning regulations that would be in violation of the statute. Um, so I would submit it would be preferable to the city to take a stance prior to that date. But the sky will not fall if we don't do this before the 28th. Uh, it might be a little more awkward. Um, I'm sure there are folks in Ashland that have home-based businesses who are aware of this. And rightly so, may wish to take advantage of it at the first opportunity. And that may cause some phone calls to City Hall and police. Wait, you can't do that. Well, actually, you can now. So, um, and I, well, anyway, I, I I don't want to belabor the point, just that answer your question about what happened. And we were there for two and a half hours, I think. I mean, it was a good discussion. Okay, thank you. I think um, Alderman's old point is that the ordinance currently as written is incorrect. So I think we need to have a motion to strike this portion that said, they can just say we had a public hearing, period. So, so the, the point tonight was not necessarily to approve or deny either of the ordinances, but to allow for you guys to have some discussion and give guidance so that we can actually come forward with a draft that you're agreeable to. And so, so will that go back to PNZ before I mean, it comes At this point, we don't have another meeting until next month. So right. we could take it back and put it before them and allow them to have more comments on it, and that would put us towards the end of September when we could mm -hmm. potentially do both readings in one meeting if we're satisfied with the draft. But uh, again, it didn't make a whole lot of sense for Todd to continue working on this until you guys had an opportunity to discuss and get some marching orders. The, the, the stuff that I'm having a hard time with may be just statute related, um, and which is why.
why my preference would probably be to wait and let some of this stuff play out. But what Todd and I were kind of briefly talking about before, um, you know, one of the things in, in a proposed revision is that um, businesses operated in a residence which do not qualify as a no-impact home-based business must have a conditional use permit from planning and zoning. Well, there is, for all intents and purposes, no definition of what a no-impact home-based business is or any way to determine who is operating a no-impact home-based business. So there is no way to have them get a conditional use permit from the Planning and Zoning Commission unless they are doing something that is so obvious that they have outdoor storage of materials or equipment used in the home occup occupation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I'm also a little bit concerned is that there's a penalty um, that any person who operates a business in violation of this article shall upon conviction be subject to a fine of not less than $100 and up to 90 days in jail or both. Each day of violation shall be considered a separate offense, which is a fairly significant penalty. But again, there are, like if this was in effect today, there are many people operating a home business without a business license, and so unless they are openly storing materials in their front yard, we have no way of saying if they're in violation of this particular article, and no way in determining if they are subject to uh, fines or jail. It's without, again, I know that's the statute, but without a definition or some sort of way to track what a home-based business is, or I'm sorry, a no-impact home-based business, I don't see that this means anything. Um, so, what I would respond to that is first, one of our chief concerns, and I say we are the firm, Lauer Law Firm, was the very expansive definition of, an, of what is supposedly a no impact home based business. I think that's fair. A great many things. There are limits. You can't have an oil refinery in your house, you can't have something that's heavily regulated, right? But there's a, a whole lot of stuff that we're concerned someone could plausibly claim is a, including a very impactful business. Now, that being said, um, the, the penalties there is sort of a standard language we use in any sort of nuisance type enforcement thing. Um, the um, plain intent of, the, of, of this statute was to allow this sort of thing. There was this, I think it's fair to say, the General Assembly felt we think there are too many barriers to business. And, and, and there are reasonable people who would agree or disagree on that point. And this is undoubtedly an effort to remove some of those barriers to business. That's why we had our concerns about what could happen. Um, but I will tell you though, and it was a prescient comment, towards the end of our very lengthy discussion, um, and I don't recall if it was a, I believe it was a commissioner, but someone made the comment that enforcement of business licenses here in Ashland is, is not particularly zealous. I, 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 I that, that there's a difference between if somebody sued and said our statute's wrong, you know, I don't get the luxury of saying, well, gee whiz, judge, we don't actually enforce it. But setting that aside and that legal concern, there was a, a discussion for a period about the fact, look, this is silly. We don't enforce these things in, in Ashland as a practical matter. You know, we, we, we would have, uh, you know, it, as an example, our, our model ordinance called for occupancy permits. Or occupancy, who would go out and actually count that? And, I, I can see that those are missing. Um, so, to your point, um, I understand that there are folks who conduct economic activity in Ashland in their homes that arguably, at this moment, should require a business license but do not have. Uh, well, I think that, that to go a step forward, and I'm not, I mean, if we're, you know, using the pool hall as like the worst case scenario. If and I it's not, that, but that's the one that well, I think. It, yeah, but you know, like, obviously that's probably not going to happen, but it, but it definitely could. The The other end of that coin, I feel like, is that um, anybody that is operating a home-based business who actually got a business license is now subject to potentially uh, violations because their competitors say, you know, I think they had 75 cars over there the other night. Whereas the one that is not on the radar can get away with it. You know what I mean? Like, it's without a a fair definition, it doesn't seem like it's an equal application of any type of rule or, or law. I think, and, and, and I 
I, and again, I'm doing my level best to be fair here. I think in any city in Missouri, there will be plenty of folks who presently hold a business license who say, I don't need this anymore under this statute. I'm going to abandon my business license and carry on at home. I think that's what happens. Um, not 100%. There won't be exodus of business, but um, there will be folks who will, for example, get their renewal notice and say, now why in the world would I renew my business license? when I don't need one if I move my business out of my shop downtown and put it in my living room. That will undoubtedly happen and would be legally correct under any of the ordinances we really have proposed. Um, I should say uh, the revised one in any way. So, um, I have a process question. I, guess sure. I think the process has been confusing to members of the public because the original one went to P&D and then it was tabled. And so I think like, to, uh, to most people that seemed like, okay, it will get revised and then show back up in P&D. And now we're here. And so I guess, you know, from a process perspective, I want to know, like, why did the city decide that the, in the first instance it needed to go to P&D and why we decided that it can come here without going back there? and we would do the process different on the round two. And I, and I get that we have a timing issue, but it sounds like, you know, I don't know that I want to rush something and, and, and confuse people about our process and, or change our process just because we're in a bit of a hurry. And I, I think that's a reasonable criticism, and I take personal responsibility for some of that. Um, we struggled mightily at, at our firm representing states. We w became aware of this statute before the governor signed it. Um, we made a point to note the date it was signed and started making significant effort to look at it. Um, if we had to do it over again, I think I should have gotten you a model statute sooner because then I, in fairness, I didn't realize it would be so disliked quite candidly. And, and that's fine. You all, the PNZ folks, not, I had to do it over again. I had given it to them an extra month earlier to allow for the kind of adjustments that are happening. Um, so that's, that's on me. Um, but in response to what I thought was insightful commentary and a, and a vigorous comment, try to turn around and quickly fix the things they didn't like and come here to provide the opportunity to get it on the books before the 28th, or the, the, the enactment date. But I, I again re reiterate, the best practice would be to have something, but the sky will not fall. I am certain the majority of cities in Missouri will not have something ready to go on enactment date. Um, if we decide we like the revised ordinance, could we not call a special P and meeting for like next week and still get it here? I think you probably could. We could. I mean, if you guys like that one, as Todd just said, the sky's not going to fall. We'll probably just let it run its course and go back to P and Z to be brought back forward and come to you guys at end of September mm -hmm. with the recommendation of doing both meetings that meeting if there's no opposition to that version. Okay, and yeah, I would just echo the comments about enforcement, and we've talked about that a lot before, about our current ordinances not being enforced. And so, you know, I don't really have a concern about a couple people in a home, you know, conducting business. I know, like, there are people in, in my neighborhood, you know, that park big commercial trucks on the road, which I know is not allowed, um, and it just, they, I mean, it's just an ongoing practice. And so I have way more concerns about that kind of behavior um, than a couple people with a computer in their house. So, you know, I think we have to get our enforcement stuff up, you know, before we start going out there like the Gestapo to, you know, crack down on people or something. And, and, and again, um, is to very briefly, in my own mind, I envision somebody, you know, I'm an accountant and I want to have a business in my house, or I want to make cookies in my house, or, you know, let's say I want to do shade tree mechanic, oil change stuff. Um, our, our concern, though, is, is if you tell folks you can do your business whenever you want, uh, some will. You cannot ban any particular industry. Uh, the example I gave you, what if I wanted to have a lumber yard in the middle of my backyard and do that in the middle of the night? There are noise c concerns that the statute contemplates, but we would have a debatable time. A person could say, you can't stop me from having my lumber yard. You're not allowed to ban lumber yard. You're not allowed to ban the sun. You can't say, I can't use this equipment. Now, I don't know if that will happen in Ashland. I'm certain in the state of Missouri, very quickly, some poor town will have some sort of nightmare. But uh, I, I think the intent of the statute was 
reflected of the, the quiet type business that you talk about. Uh, our concern was, again, I think out of an abundance of caution. But it's not to substitute our judgment for you all. You all get to decide. Yeah, I do think Mr. Schaff has been waiting to speak, and I think we've got some <laughs> other folks in the gallery that might sure. also have some comments, so I appreciate leaving some time for them to offer some comments as well. Glad Mr. that. Jeff Sapp, Chairman of Planning and Zoning. Great like was discussed, this came before a public hearing at Planning and Zoning. There were a few uh, members of the public present during the meeting. There was uh, several issues brought to light by the representative that actually wrote this uh, house bill, and he provided those points. He's here this evening. I, I uh, implore you to seek his advice and wisdom on this as well. There was five recommendations that he made by my rec recollection that uh, Mr. Smith has worked on uh, adjusting in the proposed ordinance. Because of the public and commissioner's comments, concerns, he, he was instructed you know, to tweak and work on some of those issues, which it sounds like he has done. And thank you for the quick turnaround on that part. However, uh, what is very disheartening is this is even before us tonight. Planning and zoning held the public hearing. We had a reading and a vote on this. Because of the issues that were brought to light, it was voted to be tabled until our next meeting. We were assured by city staff that this would not be here tonight. It would not appear before the board until it came back to planning and zoning and we had a chance to actually take action on it at that time. There's several issues in here that sounds like they're being worked on that absolutely go 100% against House Bill 1662. And I'm glad to see that they are being worked on and I'm glad that questions are being brought up. But along with the disheartening part about it being here tonight is that in your packet, it said that planning and zoning recommended approval of this, when also in your packet you have a letter saying we did not recommend approval, that we recommend that we tabled it until more information could be provided. Taking action like that makes me, as a planning and zoning commissioner, feel like you're pushing the public hearings off on us so you don't have to listen to them. We have to deal with the public. We have to make comments and questions and concerns from the public on them, make a recommendation to you, and then the board does whatever they feel like they want to do anyway and forget what we're doing. So at that point, it feels like planning and zoning should just be disbanded. You don't take, in this situation, any recommendation that we brought up into concern and trying to move forward with this anyway. I understand, you know, at different times that we can make a recommendation. We are only a recommending body and you don't always agree with us, but this being felt like it was yanked out from under our feet and forced into here tonight after we were promised that it would not be is very concerning. I had every intention tonight of resigning from planning and zoning because of this. I'm not going to do that right now, but I want everyone here to be aware of how you make volunteers feel trying to help this city. Well, for, I mean, to be fair, Jeff, I don't know about how we, because I don't know anything about any of that stuff, but I mean, in at least fairness of you being in our position before, I mean, is it fair to say that this because at least from what I saw first and what I see the revision, this thing has almost been completely gutted since you guys saw it and said we don't like it. If we haven't seen anything that's, on that. No, that's fair, and I understand your yeah, frustration and I want to be about clear. And I, I fear I may have, in an effort to, I was, I made a number of versions of this to fix it. Make no mistake, it was tabled in PNG. The gentleman is correct. Um, as the process, uh, I, I withhold comment, but. Uh, to the extent that there's a, if it says they approved it, that is my mistake as an editor in juggling things. I didn't intend to mislead anyone or to take the facts. If that's correction, I you have my personal apology. It was, as I said before, table, there's no question about it. Um, I understood that it was to be uh, co
correct it, and that's what I did. So I apologize to you uh, as a personal matter. No, no offense was meant. It was just a clerical error and juggling different things. But uh, I appreciate the uh, alderman's comments. I, I thought my marching orders were gutted, and that's what I did. In, in reflection of your of the board, of your volunteers' strong objection, which I thought was reasonable and well articulated. And Jeff, if I could speak to this, it's a little misleading to have it under introduction and first reading. We probably should have had this under new business as the intent tonight was to get some further guidance on this from the board, not necessarily have a first reading on it prior to coming back to PMJ. Thank you. Gentleman that was referenced that uh, wrote yeah, I apologize if I said your name wrong. Oh, that, that's all right. Everyone. Um, uh, I was responsible for the, the bulk of the bill that uh, deals with the issue before you guys tonight. Uh, I spoke uh, extensively at the planning zoning meeting, and uh, of course, I want to thank you guys for uh, entertaining that long discussion. It was uh, very heartening to see uh, an actual robust debate on the quality of legislation instead of just a rubber stamp. Uh, I go to a lot of these meetings and. They don't typically go that way, so I appreciate that, and I appreciate you guys giving me a couple minutes tonight. Uh, I, I will say, uh, the, Mr. Smith uh, more or less did exactly everything that, that I asked. Uh, you know, the original ordinance that was, was presented, uh, you know, it, it, there were some areas that I think it, it maybe legally uh, met the requirements, but certainly were against the spirit of the bill. Uh, there were several areas that I think were just flat out not the court. Uh, this new revised version, while it's not exactly everything I would necessarily do if I was writing from scratch, uh, I think it corrects all of those issues. Uh, I don't see anything in here that uh, you know would, wouldn't survive a, a legal challenge, and I think it protects the city reasonably well uh, when it comes to dealing with some of those edge cases. Uh, the only thing that was discussed that didn't make it to this revision that I think you guys might consider um, is uh, some kind of adjudication process for a citizen if they decided to make a complaint against someone who's got these home businesses. We kind of banded around the idea that you know, having some kind of procedure that people could follow if they think one of their neighbors who has one of these no impact businesses is in fact, you know, causing an impact and is in violation of, of your uh, your ordinances. Uh, you're well within your authority to have some kind of process for that. Uh, the bill doesn't doesn't lay out any restrictions there. Uh, it's probably a good idea to have some kind of framework so that if people are thinking that their neighbors are pushing their luck, you know, they don't have to immediately jump to a lawsuit uh, to get it resolved. Uh, but other than that, I, you know, I think Smith did an excellent job. Uh, you know, I would, I would recommend uh, supporting the, the revised ordinance. Um, you know, obviously I'm available for questions if there's any particular uh, nuance that you'd like me to speak on. But uh, I spent about six months of my life uh, deep diving into this, so I can I can hit pretty much any uh, obscure example as far as uh, lumber yards or whatnot, uh, and what you guys can do to to make sure that those things don't happen. So. Any questions? I would just comment. I appreciate your cordial uh, comments and the uh, professionalism. Uh, it was a good debate, and I. Appreciate the praise. I, uh, I, I, my intention was was to. Uh, I know it wasn't perfect, but I do appreciate the, the comments. I did have one question. Is there anything on the state level currently that is addressing those ambiguous sections? So we're not in session currently. So that's certainly something we could address next year. To be honest, one of the reasons that we made it vague was to allow cities to kind of, and counties too, because it's pledge counties, uh, to kind of craft those things as to how it fits their community. You know, we can come up with, you know, a definition of too much traffic. But the reality is too much traffic on a, you know, rural road is completely different than, you know, downtown St. Louis's idea of too much traffic. Uh, I think your definition of, you know, the parking, I think that's a reasonable compromise. Uh, you know, again, would that work in every neighborhood across the state? No. But I think, you know, Certainly, work in my neighborhood. I, you know where I come from. I've got a similar district uh, structure uh, to Ashland in a lot of respects. So we've got a good combination of, of kind of suburban and rural areas. Uh, you know, I think that that's something that if we try to do a one-size-fits-all approach, we're going to not only get it wrong, but I think we're going to end up more than around them. So we'll see. I, it could be revisited. Be revisited. I, you know, I don't know, but no one's asked me to do that yet. Any questions? I don't think so. Would you like to talk? Uh, I have a whole lot to add to that. Um, I did sit through the planning and zoning meeting. Um, it was really one of the most well-run meetings I've, I've been to. I haven't sat through. Uh, it's been a long time since I've been uh, at an alderman meeting. It was back uh, at the fire uh, state, or you know that building over there, um, closer to my neck of the woods. And so it's, you guys have some really
really nice quarters here um, to, uh, to be in, so it's great to be before you. But uh, no, it's a really good meeting, and uh, they hashed out a lot of good details. I think that um, the revised version, um, you know, I'm supportive of, uh, and joy my colleague um, who worked in crafting that legislation. I think it's um, for Ashland, you know, what some of the comments that the counselor referred to that I made the planning and zoning meeting. You know, Ashland is not Columbia, and uh, you know, I, I, it's not. Uh, you know, pretty much, it's, it's a you know, live and let live community. People are moving here because um, of the freedoms and the and the great uh, atmosphere here in, in our community. Obviously, we're growing, um, so it, you know, it's important for us to have um, some regulations um, and things like that on the books and, and, and ordinances. But um, the revisions, I don't think, are you know beyond the pale. And I, uh, I there's the representative Lavasco had mentioned too at the at the previous meeting that you know things get completely the, the whole intention between the law was that uh, this would be things that are not seen I mean essentially you know you're doing it your home you're not causing a problem um, there's other ordinances and, and things like that that can address that things become a problem um, that was my understanding from a lot of the communications that were that were had and the long conversations was um, had at the previous meeting so um, anyway just kudos to um, to your job and to what you guys do here um, I usually stay out of local government like I mentioned the planning and zoning meeting um, except for that when an issue rises to uh, where constituents reach out to my office it's usually issues like this where you know they're like wait a second now you know if they're, if they're changing that they feel like people's freedoms might be um, you know taken away or where things are more uh, difficult for them especially in communities such as Ashland because um, again they really do love this community and uh, you know and a lot of that is too uh, because of the thoughtfulness that planning and zoning and you as older people are doing um, to be able to uh, you know make sure that you're thinking through all these things and the ramifications because uh, even though there aren't a lot of members of the public here per se at this particular meeting because they're out running their lives uh, that's the same in the legislature we don't always have uh, witnesses that are there from the public because everyone's at their jobs are trusting us to be to kind of play a devil's advocate to everything and be thinking about what our constituents would think of even if they aren't there in person and so we do that um, in the legislature and uh, you guys do that here as well so um, so thank you again for um, for, for uh, also you know allowing us to have a few minutes to talk and I, it, it is uh, you know this being under introduction of first reading um, but with comments having to technically have been in writing uh, to speak ahead of time um, thank you too for allowing us to be able to, to speak and share our thoughts um, since we're here that does uh, speak volumes of your integrity as well um, rather than just you know, you technically could cut off comments um, being able to take those so thank you very much thank you any other comments on the public? Before I call the council on the motion on this, Jeff, um, we take the board of P and Z seriously. So I know it's a recommending body. I sat on P and Z board. I sat up here as the alderman, and I will let you know that we do take your opinion heavily. So, all right. Thank you. Can I get a motion, please? I, I don't know if this would be a motion or not, but uh, I, you know, I, I move that we table this Second. so we can go to uh, back to planning and zoning. Okay. So, because of, and I fear that I may be contributing to this, so there's no ambiguity. You want it to go to PNZ for further public hearing or comment? What would you like them to do? At this point, I feel like it's semi rush through, which is no fault of anybody particularly, but my, I mean, what's the harm in making sure that all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed, and I think it's only fair. Would you all like me to write something different for the PNZ? Would you like to add or subtract or, uh, I mean, I, I can prepare 10 versions if you all want. <laughs> you let me know what you think would be helpful. So you feel that the, the red line version that has addressed all of the concerns that you've heard so far? I, I mean, it was my best effort to follow what I understood to be the impression of PNZ. I think that their comments sort of reflect that. I, I, I make, there are things that, I'm not suggesting this is the only way forward, but I believe it reflects what the PNZ wanted. Um, for example, if I appeared in P and Z with the red line version, which has not been formally submitted to that group, and said, here it is, and they unanimously approved it, I could return to this body and say, the recommendation of the Planning and Zoning Board is that this red line version be passed, and you all could then act on that. That is certainly the absolutely correct procedure. Um, 
they would have latitude, and again, they've not formally been announced, but that would be a way forward. So, we got a motion, we got a second, second. so. All right, we'll move. Alderman Wilson. Aye. Alderman Lewis. Aye. Alderman Bradford. Aye. Alderman Holwood. Aye. Alderman Bell. Aye. And Alderman Bullcock. Aye. Thank you. Council Bill 2022-023 is the paper. And refer to PNC. And refer to PNC. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. That's what we'll do. Council Bill number 2022-024, an ordinance authorizing the appropriation of funds to certain so certain accounts within the fiscal year 2022-2023 budget. Can I get a staff report, please? Uh, so as we discussed at the beginning of the fiscal year, uh, we do budget amendments after each quarter. So we just finished our first quarter, so we're doing budget amendments now. We'll do budget amendments again in October. We'll do them in January, and then right before we close out the year so we can have a balanced budget. Uh, not very... Not very many. We're, again, just starting out the year. Uh, we did do a couple uh, because there's not only some ordinances that we passed for this fiscal year in regards to moving the ARPA money to the capital fund, but moving 50000 from the court fund uh, to the police department. Those all have to reflect in a budget amendment uh, to show that that ordinance was abided by. And this also, the budget is is a good way to keep on track of all expenditures and revenues coming in. Uh, the other issue that we had to make an amendment on was, if you recall, uh, during the last month of our fiscal year, we had some discussions about the River Regions Bank. That contract was not actually uh, decided upon until after we had closed the fiscal year, so that money then had to be paid out of this fiscal year. Um, since we didn't, I did not have authorization to issue a check because we hadn't uh, cut out all the details of the contract. Um, we did see some increased revenues and interest. We saw some grant money come in that was supposed to come in last fiscal year that has come in this fiscal year. Um, we've identified some service agreements that were not included in our meetings for this year's budget uh, that have come due. Uh, and then we had some workman comp expenses. Pretty minor stuff overall. Don't really expect to see anything uh, anything major until we get to the October, January budget amendment. So. You get a motion on the council bill number two. Can I ask the question? Oh, <laughs> yeah, I won't get to that next. Go ahead. Oh. Uh. <laughs> On the grant income line for the police department? Uh, yes. Yeah, it's a clerical error that okay. I fixed today. Perfect. Thank you. Any other questions? Comments, questions from the public? No? I get a motion for council bill number 2022-024 in order to authorize the appropriation of funds to certain accounts within the fiscal year 2022 and 2023 budgets. So moved. Can I get a second? Second. Sorry. All the Aye. Um, all the Bell? Aye. All the Old? Aye. All the Bradford? Aye. All the Lewis? Aye. And all the Wilson? Aye. Council Bill number 2022-025, an ordinance establishing the property tax for the City of Ashland for the year 2022 and amending Chapter 5 tax rate Appendix A-1 of the Ashland Municipal Code. Can I get staff to please? Uh, as provided ahead of the public hearing, this is kind of a process that has to occur every year prior to September 1st. We just got our estimates after the, the last board meeting. so. We are before you tonight to look for approval for first and second reading on this ordinance so Darla can get it filed prior to the deadline. No change to the tax rate from last year of 24.04 cents. Any questions or comments for staff? Any public comments? Can I get a motion, please? I'll take that motion. Thank you, Mr. 
second? I'll second. All right. Alderman Bocart? Aye. Alderman Bell? Aye. Alderman Old? Aye. Alderman Bradford? Aye. Alderman Lewis? Aye. And Alderman Wolf? Aye. Council Member. Council Member 2022-026, an ordinance to amend Chapter 6 of Boards of Commissions of the City of Ashland Code. And your task report, please. As included in your packet, my understanding, this ordinance was amended, or this code section was amended by ordinance uh, a few years back to expand to 13 members and add a few more additional potential alternates beyond the Mayor and the Board of Aldermen Liaison. Uh, in order to try and provide some clarity here and make it a manageable number. Um, I've proposed some changes to it that would cap it at the minimum required by state statute would be seven members, and then also just better clarifying how and when the mayor and board of alder person will serve as a liaison to that commission. And other than that, it's just minor language adjustments. Any comments or questions for staff, please? Any comments from the public? So, Derek Bryan, 500 Charter. I'm actually vice chair. I guess that's what the panel gave me on planning zoning. So, I do not recommend this at all. Um, one main reason why, is, as being a chair, there has been an issue of if we have a meeting and for a quorum or not, if not having enough members. I get it. We don't have a lot of people offering to be, but I also don't see the city pushing advertising for board members. I mean, there's social medias, I know even the police station pushes our social media, so we're not really advertising, and going back to the paper is not uh, uh, the only form of advertising. So getting board members in, the city could do a little bit more due diligence to help get more members on. I think the planning and zoning gives a nice place for citizens to make recommendations on how the city goes. If not, it's only by voting. So as someone like me that's come on, this is a way that I can help give back. You drop that down to seven, you take that many more people's ways to give back to their community away. Yes, they could wait till those positions open, but that, that may or may not happen. I've been on the board for a while. Uh, again, might be overturned. I have no idea. We haven't really done terms and all that, but that's a whole other ballpark. I also think in the current situation, when we're low on members, I mean, why why is subject it down? If we do lose someone, if you cap it at seven and we lose, now we have to go to the uh, the mayor or the planning and zoning aide or whoever's there, the board of aldermen. And I think that's not the place. I think that should be the last ditch effort. So the best way to do that is allow for more members. So I would say leave the code the way it is. Will we ever get 15? <laughs> I would hope so, but I doubt it. But it's not hurting anything having that number high. It's allowing more people in the case that they can. Our town's getting bigger, more population. Who knows? Maybe we got lucky that uh, people start becoming a part of their community. Who knows? We're a young community. That's also the other thing to think about. We don't tend to have as many uh, people on the board that are young. We're starting to get younger, but, you know, start advertising those other areas. I think we'll get the members. That's the only thing I have, so I recommend to not approve this at all. Any questions? No? <coughs> Jeff Sapp, Chairman of Planning and Zoning. I agree with Mr. Bryan. If the state statute says that there's a minimum of seven people, if you come in here tonight and said it also at a maximum of seven people, we recently had one member resign, which forced our mayor to come and join us at our last meeting. Don't get me wrong, it was great having him there. Mr. Lewis is the alderman of liaisons there regularly, but to regularly force those two positions into a role as a commissioner on planning and zoning typically as a non-voting member, just counting toward uh, the quorum and the minimums required by the state, should be nullified. It, it, it doesn't need to happen. 
we have it in our provisions right now that we can have, can have a maximum of 15 people. It's this board right here that appoints everyone to planning and zoning. There's nothing that says you have to appoint all 15 positions. You can appoint 10 positions. If someone resigns, brings us down to nine, we're still well within uh, regulations. We have no problems or issues there. In the next month, two, you have the opportunity to appoint one or two more people. They're, you know, setting the maximum at the state minimum is just begging for problems that are unneeded, unjustified, that can easily be regulated by the number appointed by this board. So I would also recommend not approving this. Thank you, sir. Any other comments from the public? Frank Reeves, I agree with both of the distinguished gentlemen in front of me. Um, it's my understanding, have we even tried to get more people on the PMZ? Have you been asked by anyone, hey, we can use some more commissioners? Did you turn around and deny that request or not? Published. Okay. We're actively seeking. All right, so you had a former candidate for mayor who thankfully wanted to be involved, applied to you guys, said, I'll do any of the three. You guys put them on Board of Adjustment, which hasn't met in five years, and as far as I know, is the only person on there which couldn't even meet. You could immediately put him on PNG and he could be ready to go. And to make matters worse, none of you all even communicated to him that you guys appointed him to that. He found out through me when I asked him <laughs> that process. I agree with both of you. We gotta stick to the process. Our process needs to get better, our communication needs to get better. Communication between Staff and you guys need to get things to be better. So, agree. Reject this proposal 100%. We need more people to be involved. Can I get a motion for Council Bill number 20226? 20226, Ordinance of Amend Chapter 6, Board of Commissioners of the City of Ashland Code. Can I make a motion that we don't change the language of the number of people? But honestly, the, almost all the rest of the changes probably either matter or don't matter. You know what I mean? I mean, it's obviously cleaner <coughs> as it is edited if the concern is with the number of people. Can we get a second to the motion? I'll second that. Alderman Bopart? Aye. Alderman Bell? Can I get some clarity real quick? Oh, yeah, yeah sorry. So just, we're just striking the change in the first sentence. Correct. And Correct. so we would make all of the remainder changes in there, but the first change would revert, or the first sentence would revert. Is that what we're voting on? Yeah. Okay. That's I'm what I'm suggesting. So the interdelineation okay. change would be the very first strike group, which contains the words not more than 15 nor less than 7, or excuse me, nor less than would be removed. Okay. All other changes remain. Okay. Yeah. Aye. Alderman Old? Aye. Alderman Bradford? Alderman Bradford? Yeah. Aye. Alderman Lewis? Aye. And Alderman Wolf? Aye. Council Bill number 2022-027, ordinance authorizing the mayor to enter into a Missouri Highway and Transportation Commission <coughs> program agreement. Staff report, please. We were contacted. What's your <coughs> yeah, I'll call them. Uh, so, Mr. Mayor, Board of Alder Persons, we have been uh, selected to be funded for our recent tax grant application. Uh, you'll recall. I believe it was back in the first meeting of July. We presented to the board to uh, seek a resolution for this application. Uh, a <coughs> excuse me, a 
uh, partnership between the city, the Southern Boone School District, and the Southern Boone YMCA to put in a joint application to mode up for the Transportation Alternatives Program grant. I'm going to just have in the annual and we've received it in the past for various projects. This year, the project is to. Uh, Can we clap for that? I mean, that's a big deal. Like, TAP is very competitive. So, good job. I mean, that's a huge deal. <coughs> Thank you. I'm this year, ask. they. That is very good. I mean, <laughs> those are competitive, no. and I've been part of projects that haven't been funded. So, congratulations. So, this year, everyone was awarded because oh, they didn't sorry. have enough applicants. <laughs> <laughs> an ordinance tonight to approve us to receive the funds and schedule the project. Any questions from staff? I have a problem. <laughs> I think there's a mistake in the actual contract. Um, under the location section where it talks about the scope of work, it just lists constructing 1,400 feet of sidewalk on Liberty Lane from Allegiance Avenue to the existing sidewalks at the Southern Boone Elementary School. That's actually 1,300 feet. Mm -hmm. They didn't add in the 100 feet in Palomino Ridge. They didn't add in the beacons, and they didn't add in the YMCA trail. So if we don't get this corrected before it's signed, those other parts that aren't in there would become unallowable, and then the city could be on the hook for what we've spent. So we need, I, I'm in favor of approving it with those things corrected. I think. That's a big deal. I had not seen that version. Um, yeah, I just still have it listed at 1300 for one and 100 on mine. Yeah, I'm just looking at the actual contract, and I think they just had a typo when, or just missed some stuff when they okay. were dumping it into their template. Okay. Yeah, section uh, two. Yeah. So um, we can, I can get this back. So this is going to be the road. It's just first reading. Yeah, it's just first. Okay. So we can correct it. Prior. We can get it corrected prior to the second reading. That'll okay. work. Um, they don't. Uh, they don't anticipate doing the official 
uh, awards until some point next month. Okay. And we're just trying to get ahead of the curve so we can. Yeah, I just want to make sure we can re get reimbursed for everything we spend. Alderman Manola, I appreciate that very much. Mm -hmm. I, I know that I can always count on you and Darla to catch my typos. <laughs> this wasn't your typo. This was the state's typo. Oh, it's even better. On, it's on <laughs> <their channel. laughs> you all have a legal description of the equipment. Uh, not at this point, but we'll have to uh, the survey. I made it. Yeah, we'll have to. I'll talk with Kip at the YCA tomorrow about that. It's, it's not urgent, it. but obviously you need some fun with the punch list. Okay, and so I gave you all those kudos, but what happened to my cross locket? Uh, so, let's talk about that. <coughs> in essence, the site distance will not allow for it. It's just, it, it's not going to fall within max or excuse me, MUTC and guidelines. Um, the other issue is that you are taking a crosswalk from a sidewalk and then dropping it across the road where we don't have any existing sidewalk. So that justification is difficult. Uh, we discussed that with RPC uh, during the uh, planning portion of this application, and we were advised to not include it within this grant. That's not to say that it can't be done in the future. However, there are concerns simply because there's not a sidewalk that is connecting. Isn't there? There's a sidewalk there. On, only on one side. Oh, I'm not on the thoroughbred. Correct. So it would be essentially making a crosswalk to a shoulder. Um, and then the other side of that is there's concerns with the sight distance of vehicles that were cresting that hill right there to the south of that and then there's someone in the road. You're going to make me break someone's heart who I told that this was good. I don't mind breaking deal. someone's heart. That I know. Like <laughs> <laughs> in short, it's not a qualifying expense. It doesn't meet the standard. That's not to say that we can't yeah. go paint across but, like out there if we wanted uh, to do that, but it's just not fundable through tab. Okay, that makes sense, and I would go back to the process and the communication that if that was a meeting that occurred after I had been told that it would be included, mm -hmm. I would have appreciated like an update before voting on it that, hey, we've got an issue here because I could have gone and investigated that myself or tried to do something about it, but at this point it sounds like it's probably too late. So just like an earlier heads up after that occurred, since it's something different than I, what I understood, that would have been appreciated. I told Kyle to tell you, I don't know what happened. <laughs> yeah, but thank you for the clarification. But you did, if we wanted to apply, for example, next year and maybe run a sidewalk down, Sarah, or something, is a possibility? Yeah, Long term, so Sarah has a, a mountain of headaches with it. Anyone that drives that frequently, where it transitions from concrete, where you have a 32 foot wide curb to curb back to asphalt where you have like a 22 foot wide and then you have the, the elevation of the houses there. I've looked at that six ways from Sunday trying to figure out how we can widen that and make it uniform throughout and then uh, implement sidewalks. There's no way to do it without shifting the road well into the neighbors on the north side into their yard because of the grade of those driveways and, and uh, neighboring houses. But when we redo Henry Clay, it absolutely is an option. I would, I would, I would think that when we redo Henry Clay, it probably needs to push north for side distance. Yes, it would either need to push one way or the other, um, and then based on what may or may not happen with South Main Street at some point in the future, that would be a more feasible option. But it's difficult to, well, it's nay impossible to justify it through that the tap funds without an adjacent sidewalk to connect one to the other. Understood. Thank you. Any other questions from staff? Public comments? Um, James, the only thing I was going to ask was, back when I did, I'm assuming this boat I funded, so did you even like talk to them about possibly putting in a crosswalk on the other side and just basically doing like that in the sidewalk? Because sometimes we had that problem in designing projects like that because basically I believe the context is that you're pushing pedestrians out into nowhere. Right. So some ways that we would get around that is say, because it becomes a project in nowhere, it's like where do you stop was we were able to put in a portion of sidewalk on the other side and get that crosswalk and it would be fun. So it might be something to look at, but especially if it's something that's really critical, but I 
It may not even be the same. I actually changed it. I don't know the feasibility of it just based on those <coughs> the current topography of that area and those residences that already exist. Uh, but long term, as we look to eventually reduce South Henry Clay Boulevard in its entirety, uh, I definitely want, want to look at uh, cutting down all of that dead shoulder space and creating curb walk on both sides. Yep. And at that point, then we would need several more crosswalks, and, and there, then it would be excellent. Okay. I was just that might be something to look at. Uh, possibly getting them the fund for now. Yep, I would. I would. I'll check into that. We did include. Um, Ten percent of the overall cost for contingency funds. Uh, you know, we just have to see what they'll let us, where we can land that when all the dust settles after the purchasing is completed. And, um, you know, the, the big line in the room is, is what the YMCA, what the YMCA trail is going to cost, and what portion of funds that's going to heat up, and then leave the remainder of materials for other projects, other scope of funds. Yes, sir. <coughs> motion for Council Bill Number 2022-0627, an ordinance authorizing the Mayor to enter into a Missouri Highway Transportation Commission Fund of Program Agreement. We make the motion that we approve that contingent on getting that section of the contract. Can you get a second? You. Second. On the Wilson? Aye. On the Lewis? Aye. On the Bradford? Aye. All went over. Aye. Alderman Bell. Aye. And Alderman Bocart. Aye. Council Bill number 2022-028, an ordinance of the City of Ashland, Missouri, amending the city code by adding one new section regarding Jake's breaks. Can we get a staff report, please? We were contacted by MoDOT to amend our city code as it relates to engine brake ordinances. They have some model language that would, they would like incorporated, and the reasoning is that they maintain the, uh, the signage on Broadway here. Uh, currently, those signs say noise, noise ordinance enforced. This is no longer a sign utilized by MoDOT. They use engine brake muffler required for the signage that they will provide there. Uh, they've asked us to make some model changes, and I will note the draft that you have in your packet, we do have some comments back from MoDOT that they would like to see changed and incorporated, and we will go ahead and incorporate those prior to the second reading. It doesn't necessarily impact the overall intent, just some clarifying language that they wanted to reference to Missouri statute, so we will go ahead and incorporate those prior to that second reading as well. For sure. Any questions from staff? Any other comments? Can I get a motion, please? For Council Bill number 2022-028, in ordinance of the City of Ashland, Missouri, amending the city code by adding one new section regarding Jake's breaks. I'll make the motion. Can I get a second? I'll second. Alderman Bullhart? Aye. Alderman Bell? Aye. Alderman Owen? Aye. Alderman Bradford? Aye. Alderman Lewis? Aye. And Alderman Wilson? Aye. Aye. Going on to the old business. Ordinance number 1410, ordinance authorizes the mayor to execute subdivision warranty agreement for South Wind Plat number 6. Can I get your staff report, please? Mr. Mayor, this is just the second reading from uh, the last meeting in which the board uh, approved the uh, execution of the subdivision warranty agreement for South Wind Plat 6 for the acceptance of all public infrastructure. Any questions or comments for staff? Can I have a motion, please? Approving of ordinance number 1410, ordinance authorizing the mayor to execute subdivision warranty agreement, South Mem Platt number 6. So moved. Can I get a second? I'll do it. Alderman Wilson? Aye. Alderman Lewis? Aye. Alderman Bradford? Aye. Alderman Owen? Aye. Alderman Bell? Aye. And Alderman Bocart? Aye. Ordinance number 1411, ordinance authorizing the appropriation of funds to certain accounts within the fiscal year 2022-2023 budget. Can I get a staff report, please? This is just the second reading of the uh, first uh, report that we did so we can update the budget report and keep it current. All right. Any questions for staff? No? 
Can I get a motion offer up ordinance approving ordinance number 1411 and ordinance authorizing the appropriation of funds to certain accounts within the fiscal year 2022 and 2023 budget? So moved. Can I get a second? I'll serve. Alderman Bocart? Aye. Alderman Bell? Aye. Alderman Old? Aye. Alderman Bradford? Aye. Alderman Lewis? Aye. And Alderman Wilson? Aye. Ordinance, ordinance number 1412, an ordinance establishing the property tax rate for the City of Ashland for the year 2022 and amending Chapter 5 tax rate, Appendix A-1 of the Ashland Municipal Code. Have your staff report, please. Second reading of what we previously discussed. Yes. Can I get a motion authorizing, approving the ordinance number 1412, an ordinance establishing the property tax rate for the City of Ashland for the year 2022 and amending Chapter 5 tax rate Appendix A-1 of the Ashland Municipal Code. So moved. Can I have a second? Second. Call the vote. Alderman Wilson. Aye. Alderman Lewis. Aye. Alderman Bradford. Aye. Alderman Old. Aye. Alderman, Alderman Bell. Aye. And Alderman Bocart. Aye. All right. New business, a resolution adopting an action policy annexation policy. Back forward, please. Uh, in light of recent events with the with the Welch annexation, I felt it necessary to establish an actual written policy and some forms to go along with it that we could put on the website and just have accessible to make it a little easier not only for an applicant to come forward but also staff to process that annexation petition. Uh, worked with Nathan a little bit on this as well to, to kind of get some input from the city attorney's office and present it before you for approval. All right. Any questions for staff? No. Any comments or questions from the public? Once again. like having you back on the board. <laughs> 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 Just after I said it was Broadway. It, uh, I have not read uh, the policy that's presented to you. The only thing that I would like to be sure that is in there is placement of signage on said property, anytime that uh, property comes up for annexation, be posted for at least two weeks, in my opinion, whatever uh, whatever is recommended here. But uh, prior to any public hearing and stuff like that, and because of there is costs associated with that, I personally feel that that should be passed on to uh, whoever is requesting the annexation and. You could even write it so far as to where they have to provide the signage themselves and give uh, minimums and, and possibly even maximums of you know sign heights, placement, letter heights, different things like that. And that way it alleviates the city from having to provide all the signage, get them printed, go out posting them, pushes all that to the applicant. So I think. Uh, the planning and zoning, we've had numerous issues with people saying, well, I didn't even know that was being annexed. If you uh, require signage to be placed on the property, noting that it's up for annexation, time and location of the public hearing to discuss it, I think would be beneficial to everyone involved. Thank you. Any other comments? Can I ask a question real quick? Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> it took me a minute. Um, so, I mean, anything that has to do with annexation goes through P&G first, correct? Correct. Was this like workshops through P&G before it came to us? No, because it doesn't necessarily, it's all the administrative that is being accounted for in this policy, which they are simply the public hearing and recommending authority at the end of the administrative component. The concern was we just don't have any documents in house to tell staff this is how we process one or tell the public this is how you apply to be voluntarily annexed. So basically there's there's nothing in here that is a change. It's basically just no, I mean this is essentially how we have handled that paper a paper format on guidance. Yeah. Yeah, the checklist. The signage is not included in there currently if you would like that signage. What we have discussed internally, typically what we see with an annexation is they come forward not only wanting to annex but wanting to rezone. So in that instance we would say annexation and rezoning on a signage is what we had internally discussed. But if we want to go ahead and in the instance of it's just an annexation with nothing else attached.
attached to it and still have signage out there, we could certainly look at that. Um, well, wouldn't that be ordinance wise more than uh, like a checklist wise? Especially like what Jeff's talking about, where if they bear the expense of said signage. Yeah, we would have to come back around and include that via ordinance as well, um, if that's something that the board would, would want to entertain. Um, signage for a rezoning definitely makes sense. Um, for annexations, particularly a voluntary annexation, maybe not so much, but if that's something that the board would like to see, we can certainly take a look at that and what ordinances we'd need to enact and what codes to amend to include that as well. I agree with the sign. I really do. City of Columbia does a three by five banner for any annexations. Do they put the lot number? How do they define it? Uh, they just put it. The, it what I've seen in the past is they put a, just the sign in the lot. Period. I mean, it says this is going to be annex annexation. Yes. It's, it's a banner typically. It's a banner. It's a public hearing. Yeah. It says public hearing. Yeah. Stuff like that. Yeah. And it's not. I mean, the city could buy five of them, have them made up, and just reuse them over and over and over. But as I say, the gentleman, to your point, uh, Mr. Wolfhart, uh, an ordinance that says you must put this on your yard to be eligible for annexation, for example, which we can certainly write that if you all want it. Uh, that's what would you want it? Well, that, so that's the thing is, like, as far as this little application, like, I don't know that it fits other than maybe a uh, fine print. Hey, you also got to pay for the sign, kind well, of thing. Right. But I mean, the requirement would be ordinance-wise. Can, can I interject something? I was thinking maybe a, a deposit. Like we own the sign, they put down a deposit, take it, put it on their land, and the deposit would cover the cost to replace the sign if they don't. It's damage for it. Yeah, because the sign wouldn't necessarily have to have the date of the Correct. hearing on it because that could change. But that would alert people to go to the city website or ask at City Hall when the date is. Okay. We actually have a couple of metal signs for this that are at the shop. They're sitting there ever since I went down there. I, I suppose your ordinance would say must place sign on property within side of roadway for 30 days. You can tell me what you all want, and that's well done. Can we get a motion, please? So moved. Can I have a second? I'll do it. Alderman Wilson? Aye. Alderman Lewis? Aye. Alderman Bradford? Aye. Alderman O? Aye. Alderman Bell? Aye. Alderman Bocart? Aye. Alright. Going on to reports. The mayor report. Um, just got a few questions or updates. Um, Billy Joe Sapp, where are we at on that project, sir? <laughs> well, Mr. Mayor, if you've met, read my report, not these. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, so, wait, I'll take it back. I'll pull that question. <laughs> <laughs> Can we get an update on Lakeside Ashland? Oh, for me? Yes. Well, Lakeside Ashland is progressing. They still don't have permanent power to the concession stand. Uh, but they are working towards that. I don't know exactly where the uh, lift station stands yet at this point, now that it's raining. And I informed the superintendent out there, Kurt, that it will probably be raining off and on for the next few days. So that may delay things as well. Um, but I don't foresee any issues with them having that soft open. And the soft open is what date now? Uh, I don't know the exact date. It's, I think, September 9th. It was, it it was, was that. Yeah. Tell them not to mess up and conflict with the fault of the I will Thank you. <laughs> uh, James, I promised that constituent about a bridge update. Have we heard anything on MoDOT, what they're going to do with that little speed bump? Yes. What are they going to do? Nothing. No. Uh, <laughs> Not trying to be facetious, Mr. Mayor. So I did speak with MoDOT, um, the, pro the same gentleman we worked with when we did the roundabout project, and I asked him specifically about that heave and or that that monster bump, and along with the condition of the roundabout road surfaces. Uh, as I heard that you know they were doing the on and off ramps and going to go ahead and 
overlay the roundabouts also. He informed me that that is not accurate. They are going simply the on and off ramps up to the points of where they have stopped at this point. Uh, I told him about the condition of it. He said that he would pass that along to the maintenance crews uh, to try and get some attention to it soon. Baseball field at bait? Yeah, I, I, I've talked about that. Uh, where we're at with that, we have, currently have a uh, request for proposal out for the purchase of two new bleacher sets. Um, Initially, we had wanted to do the ball field repair remodel project over the course of the summer. Um, we just ran into enough things going on with the street patches and fighting the utilities and the old sockets and all the other fun stuff that we've been doing so far this year. Um, at this point, it's pretty obvious that we need to just wait uh, until school's back in session and the ball field usage has all but stopped during the day. Um, we have ordered the uh, prefabricated restroom. Uh, I spoke with them yesterday and we still look to be on track for December or January delivery. We anticipate having uh, all of the ball field uh, project completed prior to delivery of that restroom so that will be the final peg. Um, yep, we're going to, kind of to go back, Billy Joe Sapp, now we've got most everything moved except for the CenturyLink line. Once that CenturyLink line is either moved or we think we might be able to squeeze it underneath of it, uh, we're going to start hammering that out pretty quick. I estimate if we, get, if we have good weather and no other issues to crop up, about a two-week window to complete the work, maybe three. Um, once that's complete, we'll move on to working on some of the ball field and stuff after school begins here in a few weeks, along with the regular routine street patches and whatnot. Is the school redoing their stadium? Like, is there any ability to get their old bleachers? I don't know that they're redoing the bleachers. I think it's just the turf. track in the field. Yeah, okay. the, turf the, the, track. the track has to be removed to facilitate replacement of the turf, but I don't believe it goes up past the concrete wall where the bleachers. Yeah. I could be wrong, okay. but I don't know. I would love to put that huge set of bleachers around that ball field. That'd be so common. <laughs> No, um, so what we actually... There's small bleachers over there, though, you know what I mean? It might be worth sure. a conversation if they are a thinker, they're in good I'll reach out to, uh, I'll reach out to them tomorrow and see what the store status is on that. <coughs> we have the two sets of wooden bleachers that currently are at the ball field. Uh, the park board has expressed a desire to donate those to the Hartford Lions Club so that they have bleachers at their park, at their ball field, uh, which will tie in well because we still are anticipating uh, that there will be a joint venture co-ed softball league between the city and the YMCA to where you might play at Ashland one night, play at Hartsburg the next, and so forth. So. You see Buggy down there? Yeah. Said <laughs> keep your mouth closed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, this is a uh, Old one old was not the last park meeting, um, but this was brought up and I told them I would bring it up tonight. Um, we're looking at the parking situation for the Fall Fest, and I brought up that we have an older one that owns a trolley company. That would really be nice if we could trolley the <laughs> visitors from the Optimist or the school to the Fall Fest, so we don't type all the parking at the Fall Fest. Because last year I think we had a problem with parking, didn't have enough. Well, that was partially due to some youth parking. football going on yeah. during the day and then where the uh, car show was, that limited things. But I think they double checked with uh, the athletic director to make sure that there were no <coughs> no ball games or anything, and they have full use of all of the parking lots over there. Okay. So it should be less of a problem. The, the YMCA flag football program will be going on at that time, and there are Saturday morning games. There are also rules they about other people check. conducting business with the city. There are rules <laughs> about, <laughs> about yeah. donating. I think they donate. <laughs> I, but we're open to a conversation. <laughs> There's also, in any event, has um, buses as well. So yeah, no, no. There are several local businesses that could help. 
So, so theoretically, was a uh, alderman that had a trolley company. Yes, the Missouri Ethics Commission has some persnickety rules about that. Uh, we could thread the needle if you wanted, but uh, yes, hypothetically. Way to go, man. Leading us down a path. Last thing I have is uh, Kyle and I have discussed this today. We're, we're going to do a workshop for impact fees with all the older persons. So be looking for that email and uh, hopefully everybody can join and attend it. So that's it. City Administrator Report. <coughs> Only thing I have additional, I just got an email uh, earlier when I was speaking with Doris ahead of the meeting, but uh, we will receive our next payment, our second payment for the ARPA funding. It says they anticipate this money will clear our bank account on Wednesday. The amount of that payment is $400,342.57. That is all I have. Thank you, sir. City Manager, City Transport. Yes, sir. Um, I don't have much stuff really, but one of the things that I want to do is I start doing more work for you all. Um, and it's part of the process and communication that Alderman Bell talked about, uh, is make sure I have a clear idea of what you all want me to do and what I'm thinking about doing. So uh, we talked about what I'm going to do with PNZ, uh, present them the red line version for them to look at. Um, the, uh, the chore that I want to just tell you about so that when in a month or two if I come here with an ordinance you'll know a little more about it. I think that would help. I wish I had done more of that in the uh, in-home business thing. So in the furtherance of moving forward, I'm now telling you that the chief of police has been talking to me about a crossing guard issue. Uh, I'm, Surprised to discover there isn't a, a state statute about crossing guards. Uh, their legal authority to direct traffic, their liability, are they employees or not? Are they covered by work comp? Do they get immunity? Is it a dangerous condition that could constitute an exception to immunity? And so I'm giving some thought to crossing guards, something that I said the chief brought up. I think it's a good point. I'm not sure where my final recommendation is. I'm not ready to discuss it, but I. Well, I would just let you all know this is what I'm thinking about, this is what I'm working on now. So when I come back and, hey, I've written you an ordinance, you might have a little more frame of reference for it. Yes, sir. Uh, before we go to Public Works Advisor Report, uh, I will follow up something else. Uh, I asked Kyle a couple weeks ago to do about streaming the meetings, and we are doing their test tonight. So hopefully that will work out great, and we'll start seeing our meetings on YouTube, Facebook, whatever. YouTube's plan. So YouTube, yeah. Testing the capabilities of these cameras to see if they capture sufficient audio and video. All right. Public. Hey, Can you contact? I'll just hit the high points, Mr. Mayor. Uh, one thing I want to touch base is on the Perry Avenue project. Uh, design is complete. We're yeah, we've cleared environmental concerns. We don't care about any bats or their nesting trees. Um, <laughs> Don't hold back if you really think. <laughs> we, uh, right now, we, we were able to uh, just do some recent bid projects that happened over uh, in Fulton. Uh, had similar line item work within their scope. We were able to cross reference those numbers in comparison. We have some concerns over budgeting, uh, so we are looking at some different ways to try and reduce those costs. Uh, we're waiting to hear back from MoDOT as to MoDOT and EDA, excuse me, as to what will be acceptable for those to still remain eligible for the funding streams. Um, but essentially there, there may be some changes to where this project becomes more of a uh, completely city ran project where we were the general contractor and we would sub out the, the various different phases, which would be the majority of it, but um, just looking at if that's a possibility and to still remain eligible for the funding that may come down the way. Uh, we'll Recently, we were going to do some electric repairs over at the park for our pond fountain. We were under the impression that that was due to a faulty leg of the electric line, and it turns out it was a faulty GFCI uh, outlet. So it went from $1,000 to $15 fix. So it's kind of a good day. Um, and then the sanitary sewer, we still had the facility plan underway with Bartlett and West. It just kind of rubber maps all the things that we're going to do in the future with the uh, sanitary sewer system, required improvements, permit compliance, so on and so forth. 
Uh, BCRSD continues to do excellent work. They have been a blessing and a half to have on board, and uh, their ops report is included in your packet. If you would like some reading material for when you're trying to go to sleep a little bit, I mean, it's really, you know, I, I deal with it, and it's still really boring stuff, like biochemical oxygen demand numbers and <coughs> things like that. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Any questions for Mr. Crudel? All right. Community Development Report. <coughs> Mr. Mayor, Steve Port, uh, Darren Ratterman, Community Development. So good as being with Board of Um. So the highlight to this, basically, SmartGov is progressing forward. Uh, Leslie and I are meeting with them weekly, and right now we're going through all the details of, of permitting and inspections and just customizing everything so it fits our needs. Um, Lot 1 East National Plaza, the Taco Bell, uh, did not come before you tonight because it was brought to my attention at the last minute that there were some issues with uh, stormwater drainage, and I wanted to make sure that PNC did not have something go forward that wasn't completely ready for you. So it is coming before you the first meeting of next month. We have gotten the revisions sent to us, waiting for John to look at them when he comes back from his vacation. Uh, scooters, as everyone has seen, is progressing. Uh, they are on schedule. And so they they went vertical pretty quickly at the small building. So it's just filling in the details now, so the progress won't look as exciting for the next few weeks as, as it has. Uh, Lakeside Ashland, I sent out from the meeting yesterday the issues that need to be addressed before the soft opening. So um, they should be uh, addressing those things in short order and making sure everything is, is in place. Amazon is pretty much completely done. Uh, they're still waiting on some equipment. They have heaters that are supposed to go in the canopy to keep the drivers warm in the winter, I guess, when they're loading. Uh, so those are still on back order, uh, amazingly, after months and months. I mean, they ordered them before they started. They still don't have so. Didn't they order them through Amazon? <laughs> that is a joke I made many times out there. <laughs> uh, so let's see. Middle schools continuing on. Rankin has broken ground, and the footings are pretty much done. Yummy O's. If anybody knows something that I don't, I haven't heard from him in a while. No. I haven't done inspections over there, so I don't really know where that's Um Continuing on to code enforcement, weeds continue to be an ongoing problem. Uh, I've taken a little different stance, maybe than in the past, not saying right or wrong, just it's the way I do things. Uh, if there's a weed complaint, I go and try to talk to the owner where the weeds are, and typically it doesn't become a reoccurring problem then. There are a few problem characters that still choose not to mow, but I am in constant ongoing discussions with, with those individuals, trying to get a remedy. Um, so there's that. Um, and Harbor Plain, some people may have noticed that there is some uh, site work going on up there, and that is for the storage units that were approved a few months ago. So they're finally breaking ground on that. Uh, and on that note, Cobblestone Court over there off Commerce Drive. They have not done anything with that in a while, so I don't know where that stands. They have their material, but uh, that's that. Any questions? Any questions for Darren? Um, just curious, mm -hmm. and this might be with you and Kim. There has been a rumor that's been going around since after even before break time bill. Do you know anything about an old I have not heard anything at all. to me. Okay. If, if you I, can find I that out. I'm hearing then. that there's a go to come in the Nollies over there. If you can get further details, we're interested. <laughs> Definitely. So the whole, the whole point of him doing this monthly report now is that, you know,
you know, typically we're having conversations with folks well ahead of a formal submittal before <coughs> finding zoning, but it's still within the public purview and record at that point. So that's why we try and include those things mm -hmm. earlier, like Taco Bell, for an example, we had on there prior to their actual submittal. So you'll know when, when we know, unfortunately. I mean, this Mexican pizza thing is serious. I don't really feel like it's not getting enough attention. <laughs> But like, where do we draw the line? I will say, like, some companies do. I mean, part of it is that, you know, Maybe it's a secret for a while. So we'll execute an NDA or something, and then it will be okay. I mean, it's important to some companies that it not be disclosed because they're looking at multiple sites, and I don't want to out them early, too early and ruin our chances. You wouldn't want to advertise your if the property value would fantastically jump. For example, for oh, sure. we're thinking of building our giant building. Darn it, say. Properties are actually a very reasonable, practical concern. Okay. Like Walmart coming to town? So, uh, <coughs> we want that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, sir. Moving on to Board of Alderman Report. Alderman Wilson? Nothing. Alderman Lewis? No report. Alderman Bradford? Uh, this, and I probably should have asked Kyle this earlier, but I had two constituents who have asked me the exact same question. And tonight being recorded, why is it that they cannot watch like they used to be able to the city meetings before mm -hmm. and now they cannot? So again, that's why we're kind of testing this tonight to see what our capabilities are so we can get those back out there. I know that was kind of brought up. I don't know how it was done previously, unfortunately. I think it was done on Facebook. And that's what I was doing. Facebook Live with yeah. the mayor's yeah. personal cell phone. Yeah. yeah. So well, there you have it. Oh, there you go. Are you still volunteer cell phone or Facebook? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> it was a COVID thing. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. All one over. Um, I think we all received uh, yet another email about the dandelion, and I do appreciate this uh, letter that Nathan. Drafted. Can we share that with individuals as they? It's in the packet now, that's why we kind of put it there, so it's in the public okay. purview. Yeah. Okay. All right. And I did hear from a couple of people about the um, at-home business ordinance. I, there's some people spreading some misinformation out there, so there were a couple of people kind of wound up about it. And, but I think I think it's gonna be okay. So did anyone send the letter to this lady? I mean, I know maybe you responded. We didn't. I, I mean, we. I guess we technically had the letter, but we didn't have it to send to anybody. Can so I request that the city that you have send that letter? Yeah, to so we her? can take it over to the dandelion. Um, oh, to the person who complained. complained. Oh, to the person that complained. I mean, yeah. there's been a variety at this point. Well, the late. I mean. The one that we got just this week, I think. Oh, yeah, I can respond to her email right now and give it to her if she like. Yeah, I think that'd be helpful. And that's, yeah, and that's, sorry, I'm out of turn. She said she was going to tattle on us if we didn't do anything well, about it. Well, so that's the thing is, like, <laughs> although. <laughs> you yeah. might be hearing from her. She <laughs> said she would take it up a level. I'm going to go tell mommy. But yeah. I think it's important, like, there's nothing that frustrates me more just in my personal life is that if I'm upset about something and I email somebody and they blow me off. So I think that although we are probably had about all those we can take, I think it is important even if it's just a thanks for your email, here's this letter, and just continue to send that out because it's the fair thing to do to somebody that has a concern. Kyle, is she the only one that's uh, so, I mean, I, that's the only one that I've received. I only received it because I think Doris forwarded it to me. So, I mean, if you guys are getting more and you need, I mean, Doris frequently hits me up with, you know, questions or assistance and, and helping with the response. So, if you guys need help responding or if you need the copy of the letter so you can email it, let me know. But the only ones I'm aware of are the one that I was forwarded. And, I mean, the letter that Nathan provides is quite detailed and, and I think comprehensive in his analysis. Feel free to share it with whomever you wish. It was really well done. Thank you. As the letter makes clear, adult businesses are highly regulated in, in these folks are in it. So. Alderman Bell. No report. Alderman Bell. 
Why do you say me last? You know I'm going to go on some tangent. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't want to disappoint you. So, okay. um, I'm actually really tired of talking about this to be 1,000% honest with you, but since we're on like meeting 13 of Wells' property, uh, I'm just going to throw it back out there. A um, couple concerns that I personally have. Um, you know, if you recall, we had a couple of discussions uh, over Zoom, which obviously makes it a little bit easier for um, the citizens to jump on and voice their opinion rather than showing up for a meeting. I completely get it. People have lives and things of that nature. Um, but I, I just do kind of want to call everybody's attention back to two separate occasions. One, when Mr. Martin was beginning Liberty Landing North, the absolute deluge and the questions that the board had about traffic on Liberty Lane and how are we going to, you know, how are we going to justify that with all these houses and all those things. I mean, that was a very significant concern. Um, fast forward to uh, the gentleman that wanted the uh, commercial development up next to Lakeside Ashland um, that we actually voted against. I mean, we decided we declined it and he wanted his property in the city enough that he made some revisions, kind of reached out to people and said, "Here, what's you know what's wrong? Let me let me make this work." And so he brought it back up, and and we you know re-examined it and, and ultimately uh, confirmed the annexation of that property. And that's a commercial piece of property, which generally speaking, the city is uh, you know tend to benefit more from. My concern is still that. I'm not going to push it up. I mean, I'm not on the board to make enemies by any stretch of the imagination. So the fact that we tabled it again, um, I'm not, you know, I didn't want to push that issue. But it concerns me that we're going on like month seven of issues with the footprint and the property dispute and all of those things. And we haven't even, I mean, nobody's even had a chance to say, you know, what's your plans for entrance and exit off of M. You know, where's your you know, where's your major entrance gonna be? How close to the SMARS and across the road from West Oaks and Sunset Meadows and all those things. Like we haven't even discussed that and I am seriously concerned that if they ever get the property dispute figured out we'll be on month ten if we go down that path. And so I would really prefer that this be the last time that that's get tabled, and if so, be it if we need to vote against it and let them get their ducks in a row and bring it back in six months, then so be it. But I think it is drug on, drug on long enough, and we haven't even really hit on any of the issues that actually affect the city, not just the property owner. Yeah, that can be it. Can I ask a question? Of me? Yeah, sure. Just because, uh, from a process perspective, in the past when we had those questions about traffic and what are you going to do with it and all of that, did that happen at the annexation stage or did that happen with the planning in the next, the second stage? Because well, I don't, don't think I've been on long enough to. I, I mean, I've been through a couple of these, but I think. Well, you were on as long as I well, but have my been. So the was it was the second stage. So when Liberty North like came into existence. I mean, before it was platted or anything of that nature, the concern was Liberty Lane is a county road. City's gonna have to take it over. There's already traffic at the school. What are you gonna do? What's, you know, I mean, that was a, a major issue. And obviously, I mean, we have plans in place, right? There were things that were, um, Ashland Commons was potentially going to be a thing. There was potentially going to be Main Street would have potentially been redirected straight across into Liberty. I mean, there was discussions about things that were going to happen. Um, and then even once it was platted, I know that there was discussion about routing traffic and there was even, if you all remember, there is a Welch Road in Martin's northwest corner mm -hmm. that is ultimately going to connect into the back of the Welch property which is going to encourage funneling traffic onto M Highway. My major concern is that if this stays in the county, the most number of houses I think that you could put on that property is 20. I, depending on zoning, it's either like a three acre limit or a five acre limit. Um, so it could be 21. 
uh, something to that effect. But if you put 70 plus houses on there, all of that plus everything that we were concerned about being on Liberty Heat Lane can now come through M, except you can't do anything about the intersection of Main and Broadway. And so, again, it's, been, it's a dead horse, but like, I feel like we haven't even really got into that because the focus has been on what piece of land is what and not like how does this benefit the city or does it. Um, and I think that the, the property tax, I mean, you know, we're talking about property tax rates and stuff like that. I mean, the money that would be generated just off of the, the, the real estate taxes on 70 houses is like $10,000. I mean, what is it, like 34? It might be more on real estate. It might be $200 a house or something like that. But that's just, there's no way that that is going to ever offset all of the stuff that the city's going to have to do to accommodate that. And, you know, again, not trying to force it, but, like, I, I, you know, I mean, we're recording this, so in, like, five years when you can't back out of your spot downtown, I'm going to be like, remember I said <laughs> I was concerned about this. You, you know, because that's the thing. We've talked about downtown traffic up with the, the downtown beautification. we talked about parking issues. we talked about removing spots, adding spots, and, I mean, all of that stuff is going to be right there. And there used to be a crossing guard at that spot till she hit a car with her stop sign and um, and she was I think she was retired. <laughs> she was not necessarily retired. But you know, I mean it's not it's a dangerous intersection. If you drive through there when school is out, you may sit there for twenty minutes, you may have a kid dart in front of you, and we're seriously close to considering adding another seventy households worth of cars right through there. And I just think we've completely overlooked all of that. That's it. That's it. For real. You sure? I'm positive. Unless that has another question. I'll be yeah, no, that was helpful. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> General comments from the public? <laughs> <laughs> Second verse, same as the first. <laughs> uh, since uh, Alderman Volker brought it up, uh, I wanted to remind the board and possibly answer uh, Older Woman Bell's question. And for Darren's information, since I'm not positive he was in this position, when Liberty Landing North was approved, there was comments and questions about the amount of traffic being put on the Liberty. And as a condition of that development going in, he had brought up the, uh, the Welch property and that they were in works of creating a secondary exit out of Liberty North through the Welch property onto Route M. And as part of the approval process of that, he was limited on the number of houses that he could build in Liberty North was not to exceed, and I don't remember the numbers, a certain number of houses based on uh, the total development he was not allowed to get any building permits or proceed with any construction on any of those houses until the road through the Welch property was constructed. So if the Welch property does not go through, that road doesn't get constructed, now you have seriously limited the number of houses that can be built in Liberty North as well, that the whole condition of them building that was based on uh, the agreements with the Welches and this road being constructed through that property. So I encourage you to go back and look at some of these meeting minutes uh, through the Board of Aldermen and Planning and Zoning and uh, look up those numbers uh, to help ensure that those conditions are met. If I may, I agree 1,000% that that is accurate. Mm -hmm. And so I guess Maybe I need to qualify my statements just from the standpoint of I'm not against that property becoming residential at some point in time. I mean, I feel like it's gone a little bit longer now. I mean, with all the other issues, it's kind of drug out without any kind of decision being made. Um, I mean, as you'll see 
I've been pretty pro-development and annexation, things like that. And if something happens, if there is, so way out there, but we've talked about an overpass, additional overpass. Well, MoDOT, their real plan, uh, preliminary, I mean, this could be 15 years down the road, but their real plan is to put one between the MY overpass and the airport overpass. So it would be north. And if an, if an exterior road from that overpass to the west side of Ashland becomes a reality, then I am, I mean, I'm cool with it because I don't like to tell people what they can and can't do with their property to some extent. But I just feel like with in the current state of how things are, the, the west side of Ashland is going to be a freaking nightmare mm -hmm. if, if there's other things that don't get addressed first. Mr. Chairman, uh, obviously I'm new here. The, the condition, you know, you have to have this house limitation unless there's this road. You know, is that like a contract or like a special use permit? How did that actually come about? Was it just handshake? No, uh, through the planning and zoning meeting, a condition placed on approval of the plats was the that... Judge. I believe it's noted on the approval of the plat. Yeah, there you go. Thank that, you. that those numbers could not be exceeded until that roadway was in place. And, and the whole point of it was because of the traffic issue uh, being placed initially onto Liberty and the Liberty Hen uh, Henry Clay intersection, all that right there, and the school and everything played a big part into that. Yes, sir. Thank you. So, thank you. And say, just to continue, sorry. <laughs> but same deal though is that, you know, like that was when Liberty was Liberty. But if a roundabout gets built in the next uh, five years, does that you know I mean does that same condition need to be added onto right? Because that was just the concern was why are we putting all this traffic through here? And the answer was well put some this way. <laughs> well, it kind of helps Liberty, but now that we're getting to the other side, does that make it worse or better? So I'm not against against it, but I just think we haven't even thought to the actual problems it will present in the next year because of the, everything else that's been going on. Yes, ma'am. Just real briefly, if that uh, road maintenance issue for MoDOT uh, turns into state government time soon, you may call and I'll reach out to them. Thank you. Yeah. Can I make an announcement? Like, are we done? Can I make an announcement? announcement? Any other comments from the public? I got just a quick one. Um, the only thing I had was, I'm assuming that might have been what you were talking about the workshop. Mm -hmm. um, I really think the city needs to put their uh, minds down and start thinking about maybe like a development impact fee. I think you probably weren't part of those conversations. I think that was part of the original administration that we had at Planning and Zoning, especially when we were talking about Liberty Landing, because of the traffic concerns that we keep having. I appreciate you bringing that up because really, that is one of the big problems to actually traffic and the city is going to have to either come up with funding somehow so the development impact fee is one of the that was brought up I think that needs to really be pushed and considered so that maybe it might help in the traffic conditional issues that Ashley continues to have that's all I have thank you just an announcement for the good of the order the second annual daddy daughter dance is at the primary school this Saturday Tickets are available on uh, ashlandcommunityclub.com. So please spread the word. It's a good cause and something fun for the community. Thank you. Any other questions? Comments? Am I going to Daddy Dog Pass? Yes. You are? Heck yeah, I got two dogs. I'm going. They're super excited. Can't wait. <laughs> Miles too old. <laughs> Can I get a motion to adjourn, please? We'll make that motion. Can I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.